<laughs> Thank you, Eric, and welcome to the first orchestral dress rehearsal of what is an extremely unique production in the operatic world. In fact, so unique, this production uh, from the British Theatre Company 1927 uh, and the Berlin Komische Oper, uh, that we did it two years ago and we think it's so special that we wanted to bring it back. So universal is its appeal to children and to adults. Uh, alike, and such a wonderful new introduction to the world of opera for any new initiates. And that's something you're going to see lots of new initiates in the course of this opera. Uh, and it's a weird and wonderful and magical masterpiece from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. You all know him from that glorious film Amadeus. Uh, and this is actually his penultimate opera. He wrote Clemenza di Tito after this, but um, uh, this is from the last year of his life, 1791. And at this point, he was really in extremis. He was sick, he was ill, he was struggling to earn enough money um, to support his family and his children and himself, and yet he could write music that not only plumbed the emotional depths and the rational depths, the cerebral depths of humanity, uh, but could be full of the most childlike wonder and glee and simplicity and awe as well. And Everything is contained in this piece. Uh, and I think for audiences, it's a bizarre piece. Uh, this libretto from Emmanuel Schikaneda is so confused and full of symbolism and metaphor that you often have no idea what's going on. And it doesn't really seem to matter. It's like some big kid's dream fairy tale where anything can and does happen. Uh, who is the queen of the night? Who is Sarastro? Who is bad? Who is good? Why is there a bird man on stage? You know, wh what are these pyramids? Why is there a mystical eye? Palm fronds? Where are we? Who are they? It, it's a bizarre thing. Um, but if we can see it as metaphor and symbolism, then we have a key to what Mozart's music does to this elegant and witty libretto from Shikaneda. And what it does is present a journey through life, through all of life, for two guys, one of whom is a prince, he's aristocratic, he's well-educated, he probably went to Yale or Harvard, has a trust fund. And then there's this other guy, Papageno, who is, I don't know, a car mechanic or a pianist or someone very simple, salt of the earth, you know? <laughs> he likes to come home, he likes to have, I don't know, watch his favorite TV show, PBR in hand, Wine, women, and song. He doesn't care about the complicated things in life. They're actually just sides of us, sides of all of us. We all have what's called an Apollonian side, this thinking, rational, cerebral side. And then we have this other side of ourselves that just likes a good night's sleep and a drink now and again and some good food and something on the TV to entertain us. And these people go through life. They start from chaos and they go through a process. For Tamino, it's a process of trial. Trial by silence, trial by fire, trial by water. And for Papageno, it's a, uh, a process of error. He fails to stop talking. He always wants something to drink. He always wants something to eat. He makes all of the mistakes. <laughs> and eventually, starting at chaos, they find enlightenment. That's the goal, because that was what was happening culturally for Mozart at the time. It was the time of the enlightenment, no more superstition. Religion was losing its hold. It was about thinking and rationale and the Freemasons, which Mozart had become uh, an initiate of. So all of that's contained. Uh, and they fight against good and evil, whatever they may be. And eventually they discover the meaning of enlightenment is that we need to find our other half in this life. We need to find love. 
And that's the meaning of life for Mozart. And at the end, we have this wonderful duet with Papageno and Papagena, finally. And we have all of a life of love in two and a half minutes. They meet, there's that wonder, that mystery. And then they get together, there's a moment where they almost go down the aisle together. Then they discuss having as many children as they possibly can. Then they have their first argument about how many children of what sex they're going to have. And finally, they talk about looking after their parents at the end of their life. So it's a whole life of love together. Uh, so everything is in this piece. And how does Mozart do it? Well, he does it through balance, something he was extremely good at. He is the apotheosis of the classical movement. And in classical art, classical music, it's about balance and poise and elegance, everything in proportion. Beautifully organized sonata forms and rondo forms and concertos that seem so inevitable and yet so exciting on their journey. Well, this piece is more far out than anything else he put together in terms of balance. Normally, Mozart isn't what we think of as a revolutionary composer. He is the crystalline perfection of the classical era, but he didn't push the boat out very far. He didn't like to sort of rock the boat. Um, but this piece, he does. He not only writes music that is very antiquated, very old, he'd been researching Bach and Handel, but he writes music that is more Beethoven than Beethoven wrote. <laughs> so romantic, so dramatic, so wild. So he's producing a balanced piece, but the elements that he's balancing are enormously disparate. There is every possible style of music in this piece. It's more varied than any other opera. So you have cerebral, um, ceremonial pieces for the, for the Freemasons, hymn-like almost. You have choruses of great profundity expressing apotheosis, almost Mozart going into the pantheon of heaven himself. You have ridiculous little magic bells that Mozart played at the first performance, chinking away while little slaves dance. Silly, childlike music of the greatest simplicity. You have music of impossible virtuosity, in the Queen of the Night, singing high Fs, the highest note that anyone ever sings on the stage. And then you have a bass singing music of great profundity at the other end of the staff, singing as low as anyone ever should sing on the stage. So extremes in register as well as in style. Comedy, music of incredible pathos in the women's music, Pamina and the Queen of the Night. Such longing and such pain in the course of it, brilliant virtuosic ensembles, dramatic music, simple music, a little march that starts act two that he wrote on the morning of the premiere because there wasn't enough time to do a scene change. He actually, the ink was still wet on the page when it went to paper. So it is a miracle of a work from every angle. And as you go through it, let's just go through the score a little bit musically. You should be listening for so many things. This grand overture, it starts in E flat major. It's already opened this portal to the world of imagination that is so forward-looking and so full of symbolism. So in the key of E flat major, which has three flats, there are three chords, and each chord has three notes. Everything has three in this. There are three ladies. It's all pyramids, triangles. There are three boys. All of Papageno's arias have three verses because it was the magic number. It was the, the number that was so special to the Freemasons. But note these rests. You know, he does that to get your attention. It's an overture. It's meant to, to make you stop talking, shut up and listen to what he's about to say. But it's something else. He's highlighting these rests with a fermata because silence is so important. There's a trial of silence that goes on as well. And after these three great chords, 
three pillars, just like in the Eroica symphony, when, when Beethoven starts in the same key, heroic music. But then suddenly those three become four. And we have this naughty, lush, romantic chord and a little shock. It's all surprise and wonder. Little syncopations, things that shouldn't be there. <laughs> Chromatics. <gasps> Woodwinds, a diminished seventh. <gasps> and all of the activity, this fugal overture. It's really, it's as good as the Jupiter Symphony, the last movement. Uh, one of the best strettos ever written for a symphony orchestra. They love playing this piece. It's so energetic, it's so vibrant, this overture. And it's so romantic at the beginning. All of those musical things that I was talking about are symbols of romanticism, so forward-looking. So we start with chaos. How does he represent chaos? Well, with a tenor screaming, running away from a serpent, the mythical image of chaos. And do you see the three again? Three, and he does it, he shouts for help three times. So yeah, bam, 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 bam. Zu Hilfe, zu Hilfe, sonst bin ich verloren. Zu Hilfe, zu Hilfe, sonst bin ich verloren. This wonderful moment where we actually see the big strides of the serpent's feet coming to get him. With all of these surprising accents, you can see the serpent creeping up on him. This is chaos. This is what we're trying to escape from. And there's no overture to this. We're right in the middle of things. <laughs> Drama. That's romantic music. Absolutely romantic. So there's Tamino. Chaos beholds him. He needs help. Who do we see? We see a birdman, his other side, his partner in life to go through this journey together. And Papageno's music is music of the greatest simplicity for a practical reason. So in this cast, this cast was the theatrical troupe run by Schikaneda, which performed at the Freihaus Theater auf der Wieden, um, which no longer exists. You can go to the site of it in Vienna. And this wasn't the posh opera house. This was the people's opera house. It was where people went for entertainment. There were no TVs, you know, you could read books, but it cost money and candles. Best if you're in a theater, you know. So he's satisfying all sorts of audiences. He's satisfying the simplest guy who just wants a good show. But, you know, he's not patronizing them. They want to think as well. Uh, and this theatrical troupe isn't an operatic company. Now, he has singers of great ability at his disposal. The first queen of the night was Josefa Hofer, his sister-in-law, and she was extremely skilled, a real virtuoso. But he also has singers who can barely hold a tune. Monostatos, his first Monostatos, could almost not match pitch. And Chicanada was an actor. Now, he could sort of sing, but only in a small range. So the character of Papageno, who was sung by Chicanada, he always has his tunes introduced by the orchestra first so that Chicanada can remember how they go. <laughs> and then the violins always play along with Papageno so that he doesn't get lost in the course of it. He's always doubling his melody. And he only has a very short tune to learn, and then it's repeated in three verses. So he can remember a bunch of words, but he doesn't have to remember a bunch of complicated music. So this is perfect for Papageno because he's so simple and he's so happy and so um, full of folk music. And that's what um, uh, Mozart employs, folk music. We have his little bird whistle. And we get introduced. Der Vogelfänger bin ich ja, stets lustig, heiser, hopp, sassa. Ich Vogelfänger bin bekannt bei alt und jung im ganzen Land. 
we find out he's quite happy with his life, his job, which is catching birds for this weird queen of the night. Uh, and <laughs> did you notice all of the, um, the little articulations that actually turn him into a bird man? All of those staccatissimos that he writes, the little chicken movements of Papageno's neck there. But we discover in the third verse that what he wants is just a girlfriend. Everything else is great. He would just love a little girlfriend to go through life with. So there we have Papageno. Then Tamino is introduced to a portrait, uh, a portrait of the girl that he is going to fall in love with immediately. And his music describes him and it's courtly and aristocratic and elegant. It has that same Masonic knocking rhythm that the overture had, these three chords. Three times three, that you'll hear in the overture, in the middle of the overture was the secret knocking rhythm that masons used to be initiated into the temple. And that's how Tamino's aria begins. He's going to become an initiate. We know immediately we're in E-flat major, the perfect key of three again. Dies Bildnis ist bezaubernd schön. Wie noch kein Auge je gesehen. A little different too. <laughs> you see, see the, the two sides of these people, the two sides of ourselves, this thinking, rational, elegant, courtly guy, and then this simple, happy-go-lucky um, uh, Papageno. And we can enjoy both of them equally for different reasons. They appeal to different sides of our nature. And they're going to go through a wonderful journey together, a wonderful journey of trials where they're confused by... Characters that we don't know whether they're good or evil. So who's the first one we meet? Well, of course, it's the Queen of the Night. And she has this magnificent opening. steps onto stage without music like that who isn't of importance. This is the queen of the night. And we have various ideas about who this was. Uh, some think, because it was played by Mozart's sister-in-law, but the fact that she screams so high all of these, these high Fs was actually a subtle reference to Mozart's mother-in-law nagging him all of the time. <laughs> and you'll hear that all of the way through, you know. Yeah. As there's his mother-in-law nagging him. But she is full of superstition. She is full of uh, confusion and chaos uh, and sort of antiquated religious attitudes. She is the antithesis of the Enlightenment. She stands in Sarastro's way. She stands in the way of Freemasonry. And of course, she's also a woman. And women weren't allowed in the temple of the Freemasons. It's delightfully sexist. But Mozart even pokes fun at that all of the way through. So what we think the Queen of the Night was a symbol for was the Empress Maria Theresa, who was notoriously against uh, Freemasonry and was sort of anti-enlightenment. So we think that this grand queen of the night is a bit of a parody, a political satire here from Mozart. So there we have the queen of the night. Um, as I said, when we get to Act Two, we have this lovely ceremonial music to introduce the other character of importance. This is the march that he wrote on the morning of the premiere. And it's also uh, the, the hymn on which O Canada is based. O Canada, O land of maple syrup. I, I, I'm not sure what the words are for the Canadian, Canadian national anthem. Anyway, uh, that's, where, that's where their national anthem comes from. Written on the morning of the premiere uh, of the Magic Flute by Mozart. And it bleeds into this hymn, trustworthy music. We know immediately that Sarastro is the good guy. 
he sings so low, he's such a, a, a father figure. Oh, easy, so told it is shanked. None of that scary music the Queen of the Night sings. It's almost always like, you know, the Emperor in Star Wars killing Luke Skywalker. And we have a little bit of this on the stage. I often find the Queen of the Night to be almost the first science fiction figure in opera. Have you ever seen The Fifth Element with Bruce Willis? That wonderful opera scene with that strange woman doing this. Well, when she starts singing high in that first, uh, that first ar aria, uh, and she's such a weird alien figure, uh, and the, the, the harmonies she, uh, she is using are so forward-thinking for Mozart. The sequences like this. Your angstliches Beben, your schüchtern Streben, it's, I mean, it's bizarre, creepy, twisted music. She's not human at all, especially when she starts singing those stratospheric. A uh, human should not sing like that. Yeah, it's um, uh, truly one of the most all-encompassing and eclectic works of art I know. Uh, you're in for music of every possible variety that plums everything in life. You have some of the, the there are two suicide scenes in this opera. Uh, and even though they're, they're treated with that half smile that Mozart can treat anything with, they are still s studies of depression. And Achifuls, Pamina's aria, is a study of what happens when two people in a relationship fail to communicate, when they stop communicating, what that feels like. And it's, it's, it's horribly, uh, empty and frightening and bare and lonely. Uh, and that suicide scene with Papageno when he's calling for anyone to answer him and no one seems to be there. It's, it's terribly moving. Uh, and that final duet is one of the most joyful and wondrous things you can ever experience. Um, and the final choruses, the, the choruses that crown each act are Mozart at his most heroic, his most majestic. So this is a very special production. You will, you will enjoy every second of it. It is a feast for the eyes, and of course, it is a feast for the ears. Please ask as many questions as you can. Enjoy the rehearsal. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.